Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on almonds and heart health. My name is Amy Knight and I'm an accredited practicing dietitian and project coordinator at Nutrition Australia. I will be hosting today's webinar and we are so glad that you are able to join us. Before we jump in, I'll just go over a few housekeeping items. Redback Conferencing are facilitating today's webinar. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar today, click on the help icon on the top right hand corner of your screen and they will be able to assist. Following our two presenters today, we will have a Q&A session, so please send through your questions throughout the webinar. To submit a question, question, click on the blue hand icon on the top right hand corner of your screen. And be sure to stay online following the Q&A as I'll be showing some, showcasing some of our new resources, including fact sheets and digital clips on the topic of almonds and heart health, which you can access for free. Following today's webinar, a link will also take you to a short feedback survey followed by the professional development quiz for you to complete as we would really appreciate your feedback on today. Finally, a recording of today's webinar along with a copy of the slides will be made available shortly after. Before I introduce our presenters today, I'll just give you a brief background on Nutrition Australia and also the project we are currently delivering in partnership with Horticulture Innovation Australia and the Almond Board of Australia. Nutrition Australia is a not-for-profit organisation founded in 1979 with the vision of healthy eating for all Australians. We developed the Healthy Eating Pyramid, which was most recently revised in 2015 to be in line with the current Australian Dietary Guidelines. One of our many services include the delivery of small to large scale projects across different industries. The, Eating, the Educating Health Professionals project is one of our large scale projects that we are currently delivering in partnership. To provide some background on the Educating Health Professionals project, the project commenced in May of 2018 and will run for two and a half years until October of next year. Port Innovation and the Almond Board of Australia identified a significant opportunity to better inform key influencers in the health sector, such as health professionals, about the benefits of daily almond consumption. At the beginning of this project, the program was in its 16th year of delivery with key achievements over that time, including building relationships and credibility with health professionals, as well as increased advocacy of Australian almonds. The long-term goal of this project is to increase consumption of Australian almonds across the population. And the outcomes of this project will meet outcome five in Hort Innovation's Almond Industry Strategic Investment Plan. Let's get started with today's presentations. The learning objectives of today's session are to one, understand the latest research linking nuts and almond consumption and the benefits for heart health. And two, to understand the latest evidence and recommendations for dietary fats and associated dietary patterns for heart health. Now to introduce today's speakers, our first presenter is Dr. Elizabeth Neal. Elizabeth is an advanced accredited practicing dietitian from the University of Wollongong. Elizabeth's research focuses on the evidence-based framework in nutrition with a particular focus on systematic reviews and meta-analyses in nutrition. Her research also explores the impact of nut consumption on risk factors for chronic diseases. Our second presenter today is Sean Armstrong. Sean is an accredited practicing dietitian for the National Heart Foundation. Sean has an in-depth knowledge, knowledge of public health, food and nutrition, having worked at the Heart Foundation for the last four years. Sean also has a background in clinical dietetics, having previously worked at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. I now invite Elizabeth to take the floor. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. So, um, so I'm really delighted to be um, speaking to, um, to you all today and, um, and to be having a chat about some of the research in um, almonds and heart health. So um, as, as, Amy, as Amy mentioned, so I'm a lecturer at the University of Wollongong. Um, just to, to um, put out some disclosures at the beginning, so I have previously received or am receiving research funding from um, a number of nut related organizations and I would also just like to acknowledge um, my collaborators on a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today. So um, in terms of the what we'll be aiming to have as a result of this part of the, the webinar. So we'll be mainly talking about the, the latest research around almond consumption um, and heart health. And in terms of um, 
I guess, how we'll be talking about um, how that'll be structured throughout the talk. So we'll be starting out talking quite broadly about nuts and heart health from the beginning, then a little bit more of a focus specifically on, um, on almonds. Going into what the evidence says overall about almonds and heart health, then kind of some focusing on some more recent studies, just to give you, I guess, a little bit of a snapshot of what's happened recently. Then talking a little bit about some, some mechanisms, why we might see these effects, and, and a bit of summing up as well. So just to kind of talk about nut consumption generally, um, we know from observational evidence that habitual consumption of nuts has been associated with reduced risk of particularly cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease. So this has been shown quite clearly a lot um, through a lot of observational studies where they you know, ask people what they eat um, and then follow people up for a long period of time to see, you know, um, in, to see changes in things like um, risk of disease, of um, long-term diseases like cardiovascular disease. So we have some really, really strong observational evidence around nut consumption. Um, there's also quite a lot of um, evidence from interventions where they've actually given people nuts. Probably the largest one of those would be the PREDIMED study, which I imagine quite a few people are familiar with. Um, basically, PREDIMED was a study involving around 7,000 people um, where it ran for around five years. In, in Spain and they, ba they basically had a group that received a Mediterranean diet plus mixed nuts um, and, a, and a Mediterranean diet plus olive oil in comparison to a, um, a group that were on a lower fat diet. And basically what they found was that the, both of those Mediterranean diets, so with nuts or olive oil, resulted in a, a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease events. So what this is really showing is that a diet, a healthy diet including nuts, can help to reduce risk of those cardiovascular events. Um, where this then led to was in, um, in 2015 and then um, updated again in 2018, um, my colleagues and I conducted a, a systematic review, so looking at all the evidence out there around nuts and heart health. And through this, we um, were able to find that the evidence was strong to substantiate a general level health claim. So, uh, and that was in relation to all nuts, but in particular, um, for example, uh, almonds have, are now able to, for example, say that consuming almonds as part of a healthy diet supports heart health without weight gain. So that's, I guess, just a bit of an overview of uh, nuts, nuts generally. But if we now focus on, on almonds in a little bit more detail, so why almonds specifically? So I've got this, um, this table with um, the nutritional information of a range of different, um, sorry, from uh, a range of different nutrients from almonds. Where I've highlighted them in red, it basically means that the, that almonds are, are one of the top two varieties of nuts in terms of that nutrient. So they're one of the top two highest nut sources of protein, calcium, and some vitamins and minerals you can see there. Um, also quite high in fiber as well. So generally a very uh, nutrient rich food. In terms of the, the evidence, so when it comes to almonds and heart health, there is a, quite a rapidly growing body of evidence in this area. So I mentioned a, f a few slides ago that we do have this, um, we did conduct a systematic review in, in 2015 on nuts and heart health, and we then updated it in 2018. So when we look at the studies that were just specifically on, on almonds, we found um, the rev so all studies pu published until 2015, there were 19 intervention studies. But when we updated it and looked at the last few years, so up until 2018, there was another 11 intervention studies published just in those last three years on almonds and heart health. So really rapidly growing in that way. Um, also, I've just highlighted in 2016, there was another um, systematic review and meta-analysis looking specifically at fasting blood lipids, um, and they had 18 randomized controlled trials in that. So again, quite a substantial evidence base when we're considering this is just one variety of nut. So what I'm going to do now is just chat briefly about um, the results of those, so the systematic review we were involved in and the one um, by the other authors to kind of talk about what they found. So um, the 2018, the update on the systematic review on nuts and heart health, as I mentioned, altogether, when we looked at all the research that had been published, there were 30 intervention studies and they provided 36 individual analyses on nuts, um, oh, sorry, almonds and, and measures of heart health. Um, 
dose is quite an interesting one. The dose of almonds given in those studies vary dramatically. So anywhere from 10 grams a day all the way up to 168 grams a day, though most are in the form of whole almonds. Um, when we pool research in a systematic review, one of the things we can do is look at the level of consistency between studies. And when I mean consistency, what I'm talking about is basically looking at of the body of evidence, so the, the, of the studies that have been published on you know, a particular health outcome, we look at what proportion of those studies found favourable effects. So in this case, say a reduction of um, in total cholesterol. And the higher the proportion that, that found favourable effects, that means the evidence base is consistent. So this is a published method um, by Health Canada. And basically, if you have, so for example, more than 75% of studies finding favourable effects on a certain outcome, it means the evidence base is highly consistent, for example. So when we looked at those effects for um, the body of evidence looking at almonds and heart health, we found it was um, highly to moderately consistent, so particularly around total and LDL cholesterol. So we were seeing um, across the board, most studies are finding improvements in those two measures. Um, for the um, other measures, so we also looked at triglycerides, blood pressure and HDL, a little bit less consistent. Um, triglycerides was a little bit mixed and blood pressure and HDL were um, not really finding any consistent effects. And, and you'll see when I talk about some other studies how that, that's pretty standard in this, er in this area as well. Okay, so that was that first systematic review. Now the second one um, that was published by the other authors. So they um, were just looking at blood lipids. So it meant that they, um, and just randomized control trials, so slightly different designs. Um, ours was, I guess, a little bit more open. So it meant they had a slightly smaller body of evidence, but um, what they found, sorry, my light just turned off. <laughs> sorry. Um, what they found was the dose um, went, the dose of nuts, um, in their, um, in their studies ranged from 20 to 113 grams per day. Um, so again, a very wide um, range of, um, of nuts consumed there. Um, they also included a meta-analysis, which is quite, um, quite a strength. So if you're not familiar with meta-analysis, what, what this involves is basically um, pooling all of the results of, um, of those different studies in a statistical, um, in a statistical model. So you get a, a, an overall um, number for the, the overall effect of, of, in this case, almonds on those outcomes. So we can see the results for them of those um, me those measures here on the slides. I won't go through what each one individually, but just to, to interpret it um, in case you've not seen these kind of results before, with the total cholesterol result, what that means is that the the group, the, the people who consumed almonds had a 0.153 millimole reduction in total cholesterol compared to the people who had a, had a controlled diet. And all of those reductions were statistically significant. They are quite small, but I guess if we're considering that this is changes from people consuming almonds rather than a medication, I think that's, um, you know, as I guess in, in comparison to a medication, it's, it's quite a clinically relevant um, reduction, I would say. Um, in terms of, they also look, were able to separate their results a little bit in terms of looking at some patterns of changes there. And what they saw is that people who had higher amounts of nuts, so more than 45 grams a day, and people with elevated um, uh, triglycerides, sorry, total cholesterol and LDL at baseline tended to have the largest reductions. Um, but similar to our study, they found no significant effect of on HDL. Okay. So those are those two kind of big systematic reviews, but I also just wanted to give you a bit of a snapshot in more depth of individual studies by focusing on a couple of key studies that have come out in the last few years. So I've got about four and I'll kind of go through what they involved and also what they found. So the first one was um, Chen et al from 2017. They had 33 participants, all of which were overweight and had type two diabetes. Um, the way that they, they encouraged or provided them with nut almonds is basically they replaced 20% of their energy with the almonds and um, it worked out to around 60 grams a day. The almonds were in the form of roasted, unsalted whole almonds or almond powder. And it was a 12 week crossover study. So what that means is that um, they randomly allocated people into kind of two groups. 
So half the participants started um, on the almond diet and ate that for, for 12 weeks. Then they moved into a control diet, whereas the other half of the participants started with the control diet and then for 12 weeks and then after that switched over to the almond diet. So it means that everybody kind of um, acts as their own, uh, their own control basically. Um, and they found that there was no significant difference between the almond or the control period in uh, cholesterol, LDL, triglycerides or blood pressure. The thing that I think is important to notice for this though is that the, um, those participants didn't have dyslipidemia at baseline, so their, their cholesterol levels were, um, their blood cholesterol levels were normal at baseline, and that's quite relevant because from the, the previous review we heard that you see more of an, you saw more of an effect when people had high cholesterol at baseline, so something to just keep in mind. So the next one is Jung et al. Um, from 2017 as well. So they had 84 people, um, overweight and obese, but the difference was in this study, they had elevated um, cholesterol and or LDL at baseline. Quite a high amount of nuts, so 56 grams a day, um, roasted whole almonds, and it was a four week, um, again, a crossover study, but this time only four weeks. So on this slide, I've got the results of, um, in, in kind of uh, figure form, the results of this study. So on the, um, the left side of the dotted line are the results for total cholesterol. On the right side, it's for LDL. And basically what this is showing is that at the end of the almond period, the total cholesterol and LDL levels were significantly lower compared to control. So you were seeing significantly lower total cholesterol and LDL levels at the end of consuming almonds. When it comes to HDL and, L and triglycerides, though, not, um, no, no significant effects seen, which is similar to what we saw before. Um, the, the next study then was Lee et al. from 2017 as well. They had around 31 people, overweight and obese participants again, but again, they did have elevated tri um, total cholesterol and LDL. Um, around 40 grams of almonds a day, and again, four weeks um, a four week duration. They did have a slightly different arm um, as well where they also gave people almonds and chocolate as well, but I'm just gonna be focusing just on the almonds results um, for, for their sake of simplicity. Um, in terms of the results, which you can see hopefully on this chart, um, again, similar setup. So total cholesterol results on the left, LDL cholesterol results on the right. This is just the week four results. They just have the, the results at the, at the end of the study here. But basically what we see is that after consuming the almond diet, those total cholesterol and LDL, again, significantly lower than in the control diet. And again, no effect of HDL and, and triglycerides. So the final study now is um, Liu et al from, from last year. So they had 85 participants who were, who were healthy individuals. Um, this was also part of a larger study that went for 16 weeks, but in a subsample they followed up with these 85 people for 20 weeks in total. So I've included the longer term follow up for the sake of this presentation. Um, they provided 56 grams of, nut, of almonds a day. For, the form wasn't specified, so it wasn't clear whether they were whole or, or milled or, or anything like that. But um, in terms of what they found, so this study is a little different from the others where the other studies were all parallel, um, sorry, crossover studies. So people were their own controls. In this case, this study was a parallel study. So there were different people in the control group and the almond group. So what you can actually see is the almond group actually started out with higher um, total cholesterol and LDL um, at baseline, which is interesting. But when we look at overall, when we look at the changes, basically similar results to the, the three, the two previous studies where there was, um, there was a significant difference between the in the change in total cholesterol and LDL between those two groups. So basically there was a, a greater reduction in total cholesterol and LDL in the almond group. So when we look at it relative to what, where they kind of started. So basically as we're seeing a similar trend. Um, interestingly, they actually saw reductions in um, triglycerides, um, which was good, but less good they saw reductions in HDL, which is obviously kind of the opposite of what we would like. Okay, so I've talked a bit about um, some results of some studies. 
Now I just, for the last section, just wanted to highlight really why we think this might be happening. So overall, we're seeing from the overall evidence base that almonds are having a favourable effect on heart health, but why might that be? So like all nuts, um, almonds have quite a favourable fatty acid profile. So they're quite high in, um, sorry, unsaturated fats and low in saturated fats. Um, and particularly almonds are quite high in monounsaturated fats. Um, they're also rich in fibre, plant sterols, antioxidants as well. Um, what I would say is rather than assuming that one of these individual components is likely responsible, I would, I would say based on what we kind of know of food composition that it's the combination of all these, these different things in the almonds. So they're all acting in synergy together um, and the, the whole food, I guess, is more than the sum of its parts. So I'd say it's because of a combination of those, those components. Um, often when it comes to cardiovascular disease um, related kind of conditions, we are also interested in inflammation. So um, inflammation may be a mechanism where we get reduced risk of cardiovascular disease if, if inflammation is reduced. So to explore this a few years ago, um, my colleagues and I conducted a meta-analysis looking at nuts in general and um, effect on inflammatory biomarkers. And what we found was that in almond-specific literature, we found that there was there was a reduction in, in C-reactive protein, which is a marker of um, of inflammation um, in in almond specifically almond research. But it was a really small number of studies, so we I guess we we have to use caution when we're interpreting the results. But there may be an impact on inflammation potentially. Something that I think is quite interesting um, is the effect of of nuts generally and also almonds specifically on, um, on body weight. So um, obviously, you know, nuts are high in, um, high in fat and as a result, high in energy. And often people have, as a result, have this misconception that they result in weight gain. And obviously, if, if something did result in weight gain, that would be detrimental to heart health. But really interesting in terms of nuts, um, they actually seem to have um, not have that effect at all. So the evidence shows quite strongly that consumption of nuts does not result in weight gain. And when it comes to body composition, so, um, so things like percent fat mass, you might actually see with nut consumption, you sometimes even see improvements in body composition. So reductions in, in, um, in body fat percentage, but definitely not increases in body weight, which I think is really interesting. Um, we, there's a few reasons why we think this might be. Um, and there's been some, some work that's been done specifically around almonds. So um, we know that the fat in almonds, rather than being kind of spread throughout the food, it tends to be stored in the plant cell walls. And what that actually means is that we can't access it in the same way that we might normally. It's not as accessible to us when we eat them. So it means that when we, um, when we eat, eat almonds, basically, um, and nuts generally, a lot of the fat, we actually excrete it in our feces. So there's been some, quite a bit of interesting research on that, but we, we don't absorb it in the same way, which obviously makes a big difference when we're talking about, um, about weight maintenance. And what the research actually su suggests is that the amount of, when we consume nuts like almonds, the amount of energy that we actually absorb from those might be up to 30% lower than you would predict based on their, you know, their carbohydrate, protein and fat content. So we might be dramatically overestimating the amount of, of kilojoules that we think we get from, um, from almonds when we eat them, which I think is, yeah, definitely an interesting thing in terms of weight management. I've just gone over that really quite briefly, but um, there is, because it's often I find there's a lot of misconceptions around nuts and, and body weight. Um, so I've got a link to an article in the conversation um, I wrote with some colleagues a little earlier this year where we went into it in a lot more detail and it has the references in a bit more detail too. So if you are interested in that, I would um, recommend having a, having a look at that if you're interested. So just to sum up, um, Basically, in terms of almonds and heart health, what we can say is that there's a growing body of evidence supporting the favourable effects of almond intake on heart health, particularly around um, total cholesterol and LDL. Um, it is, however, less consistent around HDL and triglycerides. So when we're thinking of heart health, I think we can. We, what that really means is that the effects of almonds on heart health are probably more mediated through uh, total cholesterol and LDL rather than um, HDL and triglycerides.
Uh, what we also know is that these effects tend to be greatest in people with elevated cholesterol in the beginning. So, so when people are, are I guess, at greater cardiovascular risk, this is when they tend to have a bigger effect. There are also, um, we, we see pretty clearly that there's no adverse effects on, on nuts or our almond consumption on body weight. Um, often people are, you know, the, the uh, kind of burning question is often, well, how much do we need to eat? So um, the observational evidence tends to be looking at around 28 grams a day is where they tend to see the long-term benefits of, of um, nut and almond um, consumption. Uh, obviously, that other systematic review that I mentioned did find effects at higher doses, but where this is quite challenging is because, as you saw, there's such a huge variation in the doses across studies. So I think based on the wealth of observational evidence, what I would be saying is that with, you know, the, the recommendations around 30 grams a day, healthy handful kind of thing, I think is still quite justified at that level. Um, in terms of, of what we're kind of to next, um, I think we do, you know, need more research basically to get a little bit more consistency in the evidence base so we can really understand, okay, at what levels are we seeing those benefits? Because as I mentioned, it's, it's quite mixed. Um, looking a little bit more into the different form of nuts, so whole nuts versus, you know, milled nuts, as that hasn't been done a lot. And also the populations. So yes, we know these seem to, seem to have bigger effects in people with um, increased uh, cholesterol, but you know, what about other, other um, populations? And also I think there's a lot of scope to look in other conditions. So for example, um, I'm part of a team who's looking at um, the effects of consum consuming almonds in the context of chronic kidney disease as well. So, um, which I've got the abstract um, reference up there, but so there's obviously, you know, there's many other aspects in addition to heart health. So I've just got the references um, in my slides there. I'm, uh, I believe everyone's going to have the slides after this, so um, you can definitely um, look up any of the articles that I've referred to um, referred to there. Um, I've just, and I'll, I'll hand over to Sean in a second, but, um, and I believe there'll be questions at the end, but I just wanted to flick up my email and, and Twitter, so please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. I'm always happy to, to have a chat. But um, now I will hand over to Sean, who's going to be talking about the Heart Foundation's um, Heart Healthy Eating Recommendations. Hello. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Sean Armstrong, um, and I'm an accredited practicing dietitian and a nutrition advisor at the Heart Foundation. So firstly, I just want to say thank you to Nutrition Australia for the um, invitation to speak today on behalf of the Heart Foundation. And also thank you to Dr. Neil for sharing her research and expertise in the area of almonds and heart health. Um, found that really fascinating. And I think it's actually really set the scene nicely for my presentation today, uh, which will be focusing on how the evidence has really changed regarding eating for heart, um, a healthy heart, um, and in particular surrounding fats. Um, today I'll also be sharing with you our recommendation for heart healthy eating which were recently updated, and also how almonds and nuts fit into these heart healthy recommendations. So before we begin, uh, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we now call Melbourne, so the Boonarong and the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to both past and um, before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge that the work that I'm presenting here today is a culmination of work by many other people. So the Heart Foundation's first guidelines were published in 1967, which is over 50 years ago. And each iteration of our recommendations since then have built on the expertise and time that many people have generously contributed over the past five decades, all on top of their day jobs as cardiologists, researchers and nutrition professionals. And I also wanted to acknowledge the internal team of dietitians at the Heart Foundation who have really worked on pulling together our position statements from all the evidence that I will be talking through today. So today my presentation is more focusing on the translation of the evidence as well as the recommendations the Heart Foundation provides regarding healthy eating. So I wanted to begin by touching on a shift that we're seeing in the nutrition world at the moment. The shift I'm talking about is one from a nutrients perspective to a dietary patterns perspective. So the nutrients perspective is quite self-explanatory. It's the way we've traditionally provided recommendations to the public. 
sort of consume less sodium, consume less saturated fat, but more monounsaturated fat and more polyunsaturated fat and less added sugars, et cetera, et cetera. But when I'm talking about the dietary patterns perspective, that's referring to assessing things from a whole of diet approach. We know that the evidence has shown that it's the combinations of foods that people eat over time that may be more predictive of disease risk as compared to specific nutrient or even specific food approaches. So this shift to a dietary patterns perspective is one that the Heart Foundation has consciously made and it's reflected in our new heart healthy eating recommendations. So I will be referring to it uh, throughout my presentation today. Now having said that, when we think of nutrition and heart disease, saturated fat is usually at the front of mind. And that's mostly due to the link between saturated fat and lipids. As I've mentioned, and I'm sure we can all agree, Nutrition is more than one type of fat. However, I do think the visibility of saturated fat is a really useful anchor to explore the evidence. In Australia, we've got our current eating patterns are a leading risk factor for chronic disease. So data shows that we have excessive intakes of added sugar, sodium and saturated fat. In fact, the most recent Australian nutrition survey, which was conducted in 2011 and 2012, um, found that the top contributors to saturated fat are products based on cereals, dairy, and meat. But when we drill down to the actual products, we can better understand that these key contributors are discretionary foods. And I mean, poor old cheese is singled out. It's really mostly a contributor through mixed dishes like pizzas and processed ready-made meals. So discretionary foods make up now around 30% of the average Australian diet. And these foods are our main contributors of saturated fats, and they're foods that really should be limited in a healthy eating pattern. Now, this is not only because they contribute saturated fat, but they also contribute sugars, sodium, and trans fat. And in addition, and importantly, these foods are also taking up space where health-promoting foods like fruit, vegetables, and nuts, including almonds, should be. <clears throat> so when we as professionals are asking people to reduce their intake of saturated fat or sodium or sugar for that matter, what we're really asking them to do is to reduce their intake of these heavily processed discretionary foods. So really we need to be saying that. People eat food, not nutrients, so our recommendations really do need to reflect that. Now the evidence um, does still point us clearly to the fact that fat quality is important in heart health. So in its draft guidelines, the World Health Organization plans to reconfirm a less than 10% total energy target for saturated fat. And they also give um, further guidance to say that a reduction in energy from saturated fat should be proportionally replaced by polyunsaturated fats. And the Scientific Advisory Council on Nutrition has also released draft guidance to a similar effect. So again, less than 10% energy from saturated fat and replacement with unsaturated fats. Now, friends over in Canada have taken a slightly different approach and they've removed their nutrient target for saturated fat. Now, this is not an endorsement of saturated fat, but it's more of a move to focus on the means rather than the end. So to promote less processed foods and which by default is likely to result in a lower saturated fat intake. The update of these guidelines have occurred at the same time as this shift in the nutrition world that I mentioned earlier in my presentation. So this is the shift away from the focus on nutrients and towards promoting less processed foods and more plant filled eating patterns. So basically towards a dietary patterns perspective. Now, um, as I mentioned, this shift is what prompted um, the Heart Foundation to refresh and update our healthy eating recommendations, so to make them more food-based. So we consciously decided to move away from talking to the community mainly about nutrients and to start talking about the complete package, so what the entire diet um, eating pattern needs to look like. <clears throat> On the screen, you can see our newly updated Heart Healthy Eating Principles. Now, these have been designed to be purposefully simple, but they're also a condensation of all the evidence for different eating patterns, including the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, and many others. They're also designed to reflect the evidence on fats and sodium. So while these principles, they may not seem radically different to what we've always said, 
it's the way in which we say it that's really quite different. So along with adopting this dietary patterns perspective that I've been speaking about, we've also shifted to a more positive framing. So by this, I mean that instead of focusing on telling people what to avoid, we are attempting to tell them what they um, actually should be consuming. As I'm sure all of you are well aware, often the public are bombarded with so much information on what they should avoid that they can become a bit disheartened and unsure of what they actually should be eating. So you'll see that all of our recommendations are telling people what to eat more of rather than telling people what to avoid. Now, in order to get to these principles, we were informed by two key evidence reviews. One was on dietary patterns and one was on dietary fats. So there was lots of evidence um, and some of this I've put up on the slide, but I just wanted to let you know that we have developed some detailed webinars on these evidence reviews, which I really encourage you to watch at a later date if you want more detail. Um, but for today, a quick, I've put up a quick summary um, about a few outcomes of relative to the management of um, lipids. So when it came to the dietary patterns reviewed, of those dietary patterns, the populations were separated into primary prevention, secondary prevention, and mixed. Um, and in terms of improved lipid profiles, there was actually some evidence across a few of the different dietary patterns, but primarily the portfolio diet, which is a bit of a recap, um, that's one that emphasizes plant-based products, so things like nuts, um, um, soluble fiber and plant sterols, but there was also some evidence for the Mediterranean diet. But one of the key findings of this work that I wanted to highlight was that there were a variety of different eating patterns that were linked to cardiovascular health outcomes. But even more importantly, this variety of diets were actually, they were more similar than they were different. So some of the similarities that we saw between these different dietary patterns were that they were all plant-based, they only had moderate amounts of animal products, and they included fats like olive oil and nuts, and a low intake of processed foods. So it's these similarities that we've actually condensed into those simple food-based heart-healthy eating principles that I just showed you before. Now, when it came to our dietary fats review, there were also a few conclusions to note. And there's a lot of detail on this slide, um, but again, I'm not going to go into all of it. As I've said, I really encourage you to watch us on these evidence reviews. We do have the authors of these reviews involved in those webinars, so they can go into so much more depth and detail than I can, so I'll just leave it to them. Um, but as a brief snapshot, the evidence base was primarily, primarily short-term feeding studies using saturated fat as an anchor. There were some favorable lipid outcomes when saturated fat was replaced with polyunsaturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids, although there was less statistically significant findings with the monounsaturated fatty acids. Um, also, the re replacing saturated fat with total carbohydrates did not broadly result in favorable outcomes, particularly with some increases in triglycerides. Now, when it came to the longer term observational studies, we saw the same trend for overall uh, coronary heart disease risk. So broadly speaking, a greater intake of saturated fat with mixed omega-3 and omega-6, and to a lesser extent, monounsaturated fat and whole grain carbohydrates was associated with a reduced risk of coronary heart disease events. Whereas on the other hand, um, a greater intake of the refined carbohydrates, so things like sugars um, and starch, actually increased the risk of coronary heart disease events. There was actually limited evidence in the secondary preventions, but we there was no evidence to suggest um, any kind of differing outcomes. Um, there was also no evidence to suggest that the outcomes of our 2015 omega-3 review um, required an update. So, now, I just wanted to try some of the information that I've spoken about today in a more visual format, because I found these following diagrams really useful in trying to explain some of these key conclusions that seem a little bit complicated. So this first diagram is from Walter Willett at Harvard, um, and it shows a summary of the evidence for nutrient heart health. It shows that the impact of a nutrient is relative, so it really depends on what it's replaced with. 
So this diagram um, also categorizes these relative relationships into three categories. We have the beneficial, which is risk reducing, uh, neutral uh, or harmful, which is risk increasing. So as you can see, when saturated fat is replaced with unsaturated fats or whole grains, there's a risk reducing effect. Um, but when saturated fat is replaced with uh, refined starches and sugars or trans fats, there is a risk increasing effect. So this next diagram is from Dariush Muzaffarian at Tufts University. And it shows now um, a summary of the evidence for foods and heart health. Again, the diagram categorizes the foods into three categories. So again, we have beneficial, neutral, and harmful. And you can see here that broadly speaking, so unprocessed plant foods, so things like fruit, nuts, vegetables, um, are beneficial, with animal products in the middle as neutral with mixed evidence, and the heavily, um, heavily processed foods down the bottom are listed there as harmful. So again, these are the same conclusions as our dietary patterns review. And then I've also popped up here something from the World Heart Federation, who have also recently adopted a dietary patterns approach to um, healthy eating recommendations. So we can see here that there's a recognition that the sum is more than its parts. So 30% of the global burden of disease could be reduced by adopting a pattern of eating which aligns with our heart healthy eating principles. So this is one that emphasizes whole grains, fruit and vegetables, nuts and leaves. Etc. So again, this really just emphasizes that it's important that we make this shift in the way that we talk about food and nutrition to speaking about dietary patterns and foods. So this last diagram is from a recent article from Nita uh, Farui, Walter Willett and Co. And it um, really demonstrates that the expansion of our knowledge and also the expansion of what we don't know beyond the whole fat is good or bad approach. So it recognizes that food and dietary patterns approach is a really important area. So as a summary of this diagram, um, you can see that there on the left, originally there was this recognition that fat impacted cholesterol, which in turn impacted heart disease. And then over time with more research, this was refined to an understanding that different types of fat impacted different types of cholesterol, which in turn impact heart disease risk differently. And now towards the right, you can see that with research over the past few years, we understand that different types of fats and carbohydrates impact both lipid and non-lipid risk factors. But more importantly, the foods themselves and the many varied eating patterns also influence lipid and non-lipid risk factors. So this diagram really demonstrates how our knowledge base is broadening and encompassing many important areas. So probably over the next decade, we'll, we'll continue to develop our knowledge to better understand these mechanisms of how this works, but the take-home messages will largely remain the same. So from the Heart Foundation's perspective, our nutrition messages for heart health are they're relatively simple. Again, they're up on the top right-hand corner of this slide. Um, so specifically, we have these five heart-healthy eating principles which are to eat plenty of fruit, vegetables, and whole grains, a variety of protein sources, so including fish and seafood, lean meat and poultry, legumes, nuts, including almonds, and seeds. We also recommend reduced fat dairy, like unflavored milk, yogurt, and cheese. And it's really important to include healthy fat choices with nuts, such as almonds, seeds, olives, and their oils for cooking. And finally, we have the herbs and spices to flavor food instead of salt. So essentially, these recommendations really mean more of these protective foods and less of the discretionary highly processed food. So we believe that eating in this way helps to get the balance of fats, sugars, and sodium right in a way that will meet the nutrient targets and recommendations from various peak public health bodies that are listed down there on the bottom right of the screen. These principles um, encourage the replacement of saturated and trans fat um, with unsaturated fats. They limit discretionary foods and therefore added sugars and, and sodium, and they include whole grains, fiber, and antioxidants. Now, in relation to nuts and almonds specifically, the Heart Foundation recommendations definitely encourage the public to include them as part of a heart healthy eating pattern. 
They fall uh, not only under our healthy fats principle, but they're also under our healthy proteins principle. And as uh, Dr. Neil has already been through, we know that research shows that the regular consumption of nuts is linked to lower LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, and does not lead to weight gain. And um, from a Heart Foundation perspective, our recommendation is that nuts be consumed as unsalted raw varieties with nothing like no chocolate or salt or any flavorings added. Um, so to summarize really the Heart Foundation's position on healthy eating for healthy heart, we said that nutrition, the nutrients are still very important to us as and as nutrition scientists, but in communication, and policy, we really need to be focusing more on foods. And then I did also want to sort of highlight here that um, we do have some specific recommendations that we have for um, health professionals around the role of plant sterols and omega-3 fats in optimising a healthy diet. So as you can see here on the top left of the screen, our recommendation is um, that health professionals can cons consider supplementing nutrition therapy with omega omega-3s in people with heart failure and people with high triglycerides, and also with plant sterile enriched foods in people with high absolute risk for heart disease who require cholesterol lowering therapy. But if anyone is interested in more detail on the indications for nutrition therapy and risk factors, um, you can head to our website. All of our position statements and evidence on these topics you can find there. Um, you'll also find um, this, so you'll find this on the, uh, under the health prof professional section on the Heart Foundation website, which is www.heartfoundation.org.au. And um, that's where you'll also find those webinars that I've mentioned a number of times, which again, I would really encourage you to go and watch to get more detail on some of the information that I've spoken about today. Um, oh, whoops. And that's just some of my references from today. Um, but thank you all so much for listening um, and thanks for having me and I really hope that you got something interesting out of today. Thank you, Sean. That was excellent. And thank you to um, Elizabeth as well. I think we all agree. Very interesting presentations and a great um, summary of our current understanding. So thank you. Um, we now have time for some questions and thank you very much um, to all our listeners for sending through your questions. I'll start with one for Elizabeth that is um, specific to your research. Um, we've got a question here about the research regarding um, the impact of almonds, um, specifically the effect on CRP. Um, I think that and you mentioned that there's um, at this stage not enough information around almonds. Was there any evidence around other nuts or mixed nuts? Anything further? Yes. So, yeah, thank you very much for um, for the question. So, so yes, with this um, with this review, we were looking at nuts in general, and what we found, um, I think, it was about um, it's about thirty studies looking at nuts all up, um, looking at uh, inflammation uh, and including C reactive protein. What we found was that nut, nut result did result in small reductions in um, C-reactive protein, but they were non-significant and they were they were quite small. Um, when we looked at that according to nut type, we did see that there were significant reductions for almonds specifically. However, because of the, the, the small number of studies, it means that it is, I guess, a bit challenging to um, to, uh, uh, you know, we need to interpret them with caution, I guess, a little bit just due to the small small sample size. Mm -hmm. But what we are seeing is that there is this kind of trend for reduction, but I think we just probably need more, more studies in this area looking at inflammation. Thank you. Thanks for providing that clarity. Um, and I've got a question for you, Shan, um, specifically around the recommendations for low-fat dairy and that this, there's obviously, we know there's a lot of debate in the nutrition world around dairy and whether we should be having reduced fat or regular fat. So just wanting to know more about the reason for continuing with the low-fat dairy recommendation and, and is this mostly related to saturated fat? Yes, yeah, so that is a really good question and a very topical one at the moment. It's one that we get often. Um, so we, we know that um, dairy like milk and cheese and yogurt um, can be definitely part of a heart-healthy eating pattern. 
and that um, these foods aren't really associated with um, cardiovascular risk. But we see um, choosing a reduced fat dairy is an easy way to reduce the amount of saturated fat that you have in your diet and being able to replace it with some of those more um, unsaturated fats. So it really is just around that. But um, it's definitely dairy is part, can be part of a heart healthy eating pattern if you choose to have dairy. So it's just to sort of help with that reduction in the saturated fat. And I think that leads um, really well into the next question, which is around what we can do as health professionals to best empower patients to make dietary changes and um, improve their diet and also to decipher those complex nutrition messages and the conflicting advice that can be out there. So what are both of, to both of you, what are your recommendations for health professionals in helping to achieve that? You can go first, Sean, if, you, if you'd like, because you're talking more in this part of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, another really good question and tricky one. So I think around how we can um, empower clients, I do think what I mentioned earlier about talking in that positive messaging can, I find, be a bit more empowering to people. As I said, there's so much out there in the media and on social media around don't have this food, don't have this food don't have this nutrient, no, it's this nutrient, that people can get really quite confused. So I think just kind of keeping it simple and, and going back to telling people what they should be eating can be much more empowering than trying to really get stuck into the nitty-gritty details of which foods uh, affect what and which nutrients. So I, I just think it's about being the positive messaging, telling people what they should eat, and again, focusing on the fact that people eat not nutrients, so teaching them about what they should be eating rather than teaching them about which nutrient they need to avoid. Absolutely. And Elizabeth, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Um, oh, so I completely agree with all of Sean's points. I think those are all fantastic. Um, the only thing I was going to add was just um, not specifically to almonds, but in other nuts. What we've also seen is that sometimes when you provide people with, um, so in a research setting, when you provide them with nuts, they people will make other favourable changes in their diet as well. So they replace the nuts for, you know, snack foods. And we've actually seen when people are provided with nuts, they increase their intake of other foods like fruit as well because I guess they're having them at the same time so while in practice we're not going to be providing people with nuts obviously um, I think sometimes if we see that getting one change in place so like the things that Sharma was talking about about encouraging you know a certain food that sometimes has those cascading effects that through encouraging that food you get increases in another food and they kind of have flow-on effects which I think is how you can get I guess a, an improved diet overall. Absolutely. Well, thank you both for um, answering those questions and um, providing those extra additional insights. Um, before we finish up today, um, I'm just going to um, share with you some resources uh, that we've recently developed looking at almonds and heart, and heart health and where you can get um, more information. So the Australian Almonds website has a health professional centre, which you can view at health.australianalmonds.com.au. Now, if you click on the blue arrow um, on the top right-hand corner of your screen, you'll actually see there's some downloadable resources that we've uploaded, which include some fact sheets um, and also a link that will take you straight to that health professional centre. We've um, specifically developed some new fact sheets for health professionals and also some for consumers. So the health professional fact sheets really provide um, a summary of the latest research um, of the health benefits of almonds for, as you can see, their heart health and diabetes. And then we've also developed some resources for consumers, which you can share with patients, um, which provide updates of, of that research, but in easy to digest key messages and also some really great practical recipes, which is good as well. We also have a um, digital clip available on the website as well, which um, also showcases the latest research with almonds and heart health, which we're going to actually play for you now.
And that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you very much for listening and thank you very much to Elizabeth and Sean for your amazing presentations today. Um, a recording of today's webinar will be made available soon after today along with a PDF copy of the slides. A few people have asked about that in the questions, so you'll definitely get a copy of those. We also have a short survey um, for feedback that we'll send through to you as well as a professional development quiz so that you can complete that for your CPD. Keep an eye out for other upcoming um, professional development resources that we've got and um, other events. And we thank you very much for attending today. As I said, my name is Amy Knight. And if you have any questions about today's webinar, a few people have had a few questions about if they can get some printed copies of the resources. So please feel free to email me there. My email is on the screen now. And thank you very much for attending.